Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Oxford Climate Research Network's annual lecture, co-hosted by the Oxford Martin School. The Oxford Climate Research Network aims to pull together all those across Oxford whose research touches on climate. And the goal, broadly, is to help us be more than the sum of our parts. So over the last year, we've brought in several million pounds worth of grants focused on understanding the climate system, on impacts, policy, mitigation. Several members of the um, network contributed to the IPCC's 1.5 uh, degree report. Others provided data for the BBC's Earth from Space programme. We continue to engage with the Met Office, who co-fund uh, many of our activities, and with the United, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, process, as well as reaching out to local organisations and schools. So it's really great to see so many people from a wide range of departments here today. If you're a research student or a member of academic staff at the university and not already a member of, of OCRM, please do go to our website, which is climate.ox.ac.uk, and, and sign up for our, our mailings. Um, and after today's talk, there'll be a reception uh, just next door, and I hope that you're all able to stay on and network uh, over a drink and get to know each other a bit better. It's a huge pleasure for me today to introduce today's speaker, Professor David Battisti, who's the Tamaki Endowed Chair of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle. David's research focuses on understanding natural variability of the climate system. He's especially interested in understanding how interactions between the ocean, the atmosphere, land and sea ice lead to variability in climate on timescales ranging from months to several decades. He also studies the impact of climate variability and climate change on global food security. He served on numerous international scientific committees, co-authored many international science plans and reports, published well over 100 papers in atmospheric sciences and oceanography. And Dave is also very passionate about training the next generation of climate scientists. Um, as such, he's received many awards for both his research and his teaching. In addition to his responsibilities at the University of Washington, David's a fellow at the Food Security Institute at Stanford University and an adjunct professor at the University of Bergen in Norway. And it's a real honor to have him with us today to deliver our annual lecture. Today he's going to talk about the relationship between global climate sensitivity and regional warming. So if you join me in welcoming David to the stage. Thanks, everyone, for uh, um, coming today, and thank you for inviting me to your community yet again. I mean, one of these days, you'll probably get tired of me, but I'm never going to get tired of you. <laughs> and uh, this talk was kind of inspired by last year. I was asked to go to M this meeting at MIT and talk about the value of regional downscaling. And I don't do regional downscaling. Um, well, I do a little bit of it, but it's not my, it's not my forte. And uh, so I kind of flipped it around and say, well, where could you actually use regional downscaling to it kind of uh, either improve your predictions or reduce uh, uh, the level of uncertainty in the predictions? And, and I was a little bit surprised by this, and it gives a sense, an insight on um, what's controlling regional climate variability. And I hope the one thing you come away at the end of the day is that most of what controls regional climate variability everywhere on the planet is one thing, which I won't tell you yet. <clears throat> Okay. Okay, so there's the outline. You've been staring at it for a while, so I'm just going to go ahead. Climate sensitivity, uh, it's defined uh, for the purpose of today, is the global average temperature change due to a doubling of atmospheric carbon dioxide. And, um, and you wait long enough so the climate system is equilibrated. And the answer, according to the last IPCC report, was um, the best guess answer is 3.2 degrees Celsius. But there's a huge range uh, of uncertainty in that. There's climate models that give you as low as a little bit over two, and is, is some that give you almost five. So the range is uh, basically 100%, you know, so 3.2 plus or minus 50%. And I used to think, uh, who cares? Um, nobody lives on the global mean temperature, so what, what, how useful is that piece of information? <clears throat> and let's go back to this at the end of the talk. So um, if you're a climate specialist, do not answer this question. <clears throat> What's the major uncertainty in the global average climate? To, if you look at the global average temperature change to a WC2, what's the main reason for uncertainty? Does anyone know? Not a climate specialist? There's one thing. I mean, obviously, 
we're saying that CO2 has doubled, so it's not a human problem. They're not worried about how much emissions are going to happen. Let's say it did double. There's this factor of two uncertainty in how much warming you'll get in the global average. What? Clouds. Clouds. Clouds, right. And in particular, tropical clouds, right? <clears throat> okay, good. So it's tropical clouds. Here's a figure from the last IPCC. And each one of these dots is for a climate model and just tells you, like, how much feedback you get. Yes. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, how much feedback you get under different things. Planck is just uh, the black body radiation from a surface. There's very, all models do that the same. Then there's the long wave and water vapor feedback combined to give you very little uncertainty in the end. But the biggest uncertainty here, the biggest spread is in what happens to clouds, and in particular tropical clouds. And there's a little bit of uncertainty due to albedo. Okay, so if you say, what's the common pattern across the, uh, all the models? If you take all the models' responses to an increase in CO2, what's the common response? Here's the picture from um, the last um, IPCC. I grabbed 18 climate models and just said, what's the difference in the annual mean temperature at the end of this century compared to the end of last century? So this is a 100-year difference. OK, and we'll call the global average change this bracketed delta T here. And that's the answer. Global average is uh, 3.73 degrees C for this group of 18 models at the end of the century due to a kind of a business as usual emission scenario. Not every place warms the same. Uh, the main thing you see in this thing is uh, the tropics don't warm as much as the Arctic, right? And uh, the land warms more than the ocean. And that's kind of washed out there. But um, the, the typical global average is 3.73. The typical number in mid-latitude land area is more like 5 degrees C. Over the ocean, it's more like 3 degrees C. And in the polar regions, it's 12 degrees C. <clears throat> OK. Um, why, is there, why is there polar amplification? Why, does the, why do the poles warm more than the oceans? There's a common uh, answer that everybody says, which is actually not the right answer. The, the, the answer is uh, there's the ice albedo feedback, right? You get warm, you melt ice, and, um, <clears throat> and the melting ice allows more sunlight to be absorbed. But that's not it, OK? There's actually two, the two most important things here are the fact that when you have this Planck feedback, the black body feedback, you're starting from a very cold temperature in the Arctic and a very warm temperature, a high temperature in the in the tropical regions. So if I, I just need to warm a little bit in the tropics to get the same amount of energy back out as the amount of warming I need to do in the polar regions. So that's, that's about a quarter of the answer. The other quarter of the answer is I put the same amount of energy down everywhere on the planet due to increasing CO2. And in the tropics, it's really warm. I use some of that energy to evaporate, which means I don't warm as much because I use some of that energy to evaporate. That vapor goes in the atmosphere, and the atmosphere moves that vapor to the pole, and that's where it condenses. So I have this transfer of energy that's being absorbed. Yep, am I doing something wrong? No, you're not. The microphone is cracking. Can I swap? Oh, yeah, sure. It's a transfer of energy that's being absorbed in the tropics that's being moved to the poles by atmospheric circulations. That's another quarter of the answer. And I won't tell you what the other half is yet. <coughs> well, I could tell you, but it's not obvious. OK, so that's, that's the main reason for polar amplification. And there's a, there's a clue in this. If, uh, I'll show you winter versus summer in a second. Um, why does land warm more than ocean? It's a little bit more complicated, but the basic answer is, is a similar answer, is I put the amount of energy down over the ocean, the amount of energy down over land, and I need to use more of it, or I use more of it to evaporate over the ocean, over the land. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Mike is here, right, Mike? No, Mike? Mike Burn is some nice, nice work on this. It's a little more complicated than that, but it basically, it's pretty well understood why the land warms more than the ocean. And effectively, the winds will kind of distribute this stuff around. Now, OK, is that all I want to say so far? Yes. OK, good. So if I look at winter versus summer, there's the winter picture, northern hemisphere. And you can see now the scales are different here. So the amount of warming you have in the polar region is about 24 degrees warmer. And if you look at the summer here, the amount of warming in, I should go over here, the amount of warming you have here in the Arctic is only about three degrees. So if it's ice albedo feedback, you're kind of stuck with this strange situation when ice albedo feedback has to be working in the summertime, and yet the polar ramification is in wintertime. So you know fundamentally it's not ice albedo feedback. <laughs> OK. Um, and in both winter and in summer, the land warms more than the ocean. If you just go along a latitude line, you just say, uh, ocean, land, ocean, land. The land is always warmer than the ocean. 
So that's a basic pattern there. And it comes about because of this absorption of energy that's used to evaporate in the tropics that the atmosphere diffuses by winds, just mixes that energy to the polar regions where it's colder and it condenses, right? So that's, that's a good part of the answer. So as long as you have those winds that are doing this mixing, you're going to have polar amplification. Okay. Okay. Now let's look at departures from this multi-model mean. This is average across all models. There's the picture of me with that before. And this is just a, a measure, one sigma, right? One standard deviation uh, difference. So every model, take a model ensemble mean away, you have the differences and just calculate the standard deviation. This is a measure of um, the, the uncertainty. And you see the uncertainty is greatest in the Arctic, and uh, it's also greater over land than over, over ocean. And if I take the ratio of those two things called the coefficient of variation, it gives me kind of the relative uncertainty compared to the ensemble mean change. And, and if you look at that ratio here, I don't know if you can see this, but the answer is about 25%. So a one sigma standard deviation, 25%, and this is consistent with the global mean. It means you have a plus or minus 50% is kind of the extremes across the model, or the, the difference between the lowest model and the highest model is 100%, factor of two. <coughs> okay, so regional uncertainty is typically plus or minus 25% of the ensemble average, average over across all models. By the way, ask me a question at any time, or if I say something that's really offensive, call me out on it. <laughs> okay, all right, good. So if you do the same thing for winter time, look at this coefficient of variation, the, the, the spread in the models divided by the model mean, you find that the same answer, it's about 25% uncertainty, plus or minus, and the same thing is true in summer. The places with the biggest uncertainty are places here around Antarctica where you have sea ice edges in the, in the sea ice um, projections, what's gonna happen in the future is pretty different across models. You have a pretty different, um, you have big uncertainty there. And in the North Atlantic uh, here in the ocean, uh, just south of Greenland, there's a lot of uncertainty across the models, but they actually, the absolute change is very, very small. So, you, so models just differ uh, a lot, but the, 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 the difference is actually tiny because the absolute change is small. Okay, now, this is, every model has these differences subtracted from the, the ensemble mean, and what I did was just said, um, let's find the pattern that explains most of the variance in this, if you look at the differences, the residuals, let's find the pattern that explains most of the differences between the models. Okay, and if, uh, if, you're, if you're into it, this is just called an EOF analysis of the residuals. <clears throat> So I just took the um, ensemble mean, subtracted every model. You have the residual, you have 18 of these fields, you calculate the empirical orthogonal functions, and you pick out the leading pattern. And uh, I did this for monthly means, seasonal means, annual means, and, and the answer is uh, pretty simple. I'll show it to you, sir. And if I lose you, the, the answer is the results, if you interpret them, most of the regional uncertainty in temperature projections is related to one generic pattern of non-local uncertainty and feedbacks. That is, the most of the uncertainty in your place in space is not due to uncertainty in your place in space, in the physics. Okay, so that's, a, that's immediately got implications for regional downscaling. There's only so much you can do uh, in your place in space if you wanna do a regional downscaling to improve temperature projections. In fact, pretty much nothing you can do will improve them. <clears throat> okay, let me show you that. So this is the pattern that explains most of the differences across the models. And if you look at this pattern, it looks like a pattern we've seen before. Color scale's a little different. It's, it's all the same sign. It's warm everywhere. It's more warm in the tropics, or in the polar regions than in the tropics. It's more over the land than it is over the ocean. It's the same exact pattern. It's the ensemble mean pattern. Right? And the physics is the same. And it explains 60% of the variance across all the models. So once you take this pattern away, you're just left with, you've cut the uncertainty down by more than a factor of 50%. Okay, now, and let's see, where do I want to do this? Um, okay, so this pattern has um, explained 60% of the variance. Um, it's zonally homogeneous over the land, ocean and land with more warming over, ocean, over land and ocean, and it's polar amplified. And so that you can think of the physics as being the same physics. It's tropical clouds that are explaining the uncertainty, and the atmosphere is just distributing this heat differently. Now, if that's the case, let me, 
let me try to explain this before I show you the answer. If that's the case, it turns out also that the way the atmosphere equilibrates this is mostly to bleed heat to space in the tropics, not in the high latitudes. So let's take the extreme case. Here's my tropics. Here's the Arctic. Here's the Antarctic. And I'm just going to put a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, and the tropics are going to heat up, right? And it's going to just bleed energy to space until I come to an equilibrium. If I just if I just stop the circulation so I can't move energy to the poles, I'm going to warm the tropics by a certain amount, amount so that the radiation to space is equal to um, the, what's, what's had coming back down the surface because of increased CO2. Now, and the rest of the planet hasn't done anything. If I now take my atmosphere circulation and move it to the poles, now I can warm every place on the planet a lot, right? And the poles more than the tropics. And I still have to warm the tropics up enough to bleed the same amount of energy to space to come into an equilibrium. So the global average temperature will be higher in the case where I'm be able to distribute that heat to the poles faster. Okay, and that turns out to be the case. So first of all, I'll point out that the global average is this is one degree Celsius. If you then say, if I project this pattern onto each one of my model's residuals and just and, and plot it versus a climate sensitivity, you see that here, this is the model weight. So if a model, for example, has the global average plus twice this pattern, you're out here, it's got a climate sensitivity of five degrees. That is, it increases the temperature five degrees due to CO2 doubling. And if the answer is my model gives me my ensemble average minus, say, one sigma of this pattern, basically I have a climate signal, uh, sensitivity of two. So in other words, this pattern is explaining climate sensitivity. The uncertainty, and why is there cli global climate uncertainty again? Someone said it over there. The main reason for uncertainty in the climate model is global average. Clouds, tropical clouds. And what this is telling you is it also explaining the global uncertainty everywhere, not just in the tropics, but in, in everywhere. Okay, so now that being the case, you have uh, the correlation between climate sensitivity and uh, how much your model projects under this pattern is 0.92 for equilibrium climate sensitivity. For transient is 0.60. That actually makes some sense. I won't go into it now, but it, you expect that result to be more correlated with equilibrium than transient. And here's the other thing that, based on that argument I just told you, the more efficiently your model moves heat to the poles, the stronger the warming you should have. So it turns out that not all climate models move heat to the poles at the same rate. And this plot here shows how much the model, how much your model projects onto that pattern and how much energy your model moves from the equator to the pole in the climatology that you start with. And there's a positive correlation. Is that is the the more efficiently your model in today's climate moves heat from the tropics to the poles, the stronger your climate sensitivity is. And that's the physics behind this, basically. More diffusion to the poles, more warming. Okay, if you have clouds that are less bright, you get more warming, but this diffusion actually moves the stuff from the equator to the poles and gives you this pattern of Arctic amplification. And this is called pattern scaling. It's been known for a long time, but I guess the new part is coming up here is what's left over when you actually subtract out this climate sensitivity. If we, could, if we could solve the tropical cloud problem, what's left to explain at your place in space? And I'll try to show you that here. Um, before I go there, though, if you do the same thing and you say, what's the common pattern in the annual mean? That's the top panel, which we just looked at. If the common pattern in the wintertime looks like the wintertime ensemble average, the common pattern of differences in the summertime looks like the ensemble average in the summertime. So basically, it's just telling you the same physics is going on in all these models. And given the, the climate sensitivity is just set by uncertainty in tropical clouds, but explaining this um, pattern of variability across the whole planet. OK, so the conclusion is that most of the local uncertainty in temperature projection is not due to differences in local feedbacks or to uncertainty in, in situ prices. It's due to tropical clouds. Now. Let's take that, the results and say, let's say we solve the tropical cloud problem. And I'm not going to remove, so I have a residual that's from each model. And I'm going to remove the global climate sensitivity model and say, what's left over? So what's left to explain after the leading difference pattern, that is climate sensitivity, is, is solved. And uh, that's this pit picture here. And so what this is, is for each climate model, I've subtracted the ensemble mean. I've subtracted out the pattern that goes with the climate sensitivity. 
And then I said, I have a residual. I don't want to explain. And I have that for each model. And I take the standard deviation of those residuals. And this is the plot. And you can see there's still most uncertainty left over to explain in the um, sea ice region of Antarctica, actually in the sea ice region now in um, the Beaufort Sea, right, which is a place where we've got really stunning um, uh, changes in sea ice today in temperature. And if you take that and you, sub and you divide it by the ensemble mean change again, so again, you're getting a coefficient of variation. After you remove uh, climate sensitivity, you end up with this picture. And let me just put up the original coefficient of variance, that one. Can you see the difference in colors? You've reduced the uncertainty from 25% down to about 10%. So at any one place in space, once you remove global climate, once you fix the tropical cloud problems, so now you're down to a local uncertainty of plus or minus 10% which is pretty good. OK. So after accounting for climate sensitivity, the regional uncertainty is cut in half to around 10 15%, with the exceptions being the Atlantic, uh, North Atlantic and the Southern Ocean because of sea ice differences across the models. OK. <clears throat> now we can put this uh, back in the original. Here's the original plot here, which is the ensemble average uh, estimates from the climate models. And I'm going to put. Um, this residual pattern over here on the same scale as this, so you can get a sense of just how different they are. And that's the answer right there. So basically, there's really nothing left to explain locally. There's no point in regional downscaling for temperature. Right? And in fact, I think it, it's probably going to make things much worse. Um, if you look at the uncertainty, even in regional models, when you drive them with the observed boundary conditions, you look at the differences across the models, the errors are actually much bigger than this. Or in the in the climate in the regional models, so in terms of regional downscaling of temperature, you can only do worse by by doing that. I mean, the best thing to do is to leave the climate models alone and not touch it. <clears throat> okay, why does this work? This is a little technical for a minute or two. Um, it works because of the atmosphere is basically diffusive. The circulation has storms in the mid latitudes and wants to move heat from the from the tropics to the poles, basically. And an illustration of that is, oh, this got washed out um, on both of them. So this is um, South Pole to North Pole. The black line here is the ensemble average feedback from all of the um, IPCC climate models. Um, how much maybe local response in temperature or radiation you get um, due to increasing CO2. And all the squiggly lines you can barely see here are, are, are the feedbacks from each particular model. And so you can see every model does something pretty different. Right? There's a lot of uncertainty in, a, in, in an individual model, but that's the ensemble average. And you can define a feedback um, is the amount of forcing at that latitude divided by the temperature response. Okay? <clears throat> now, um, if you just take a, a simple diffusion model, and I say I have a two watts per meter squared or whatever it is to a WCO2 that I put in my atmosphere everywhere and I have this distribution of feedbacks, I can solve for the temperature change. And there's nothing fancy and this is just pure diffusion. Okay. And then I can say, okay, that's my, that's my ensemble mean response due to increasing two. And then I can put an uncertainty in the local feedback and say, okay, in the tropics here, I don't know exactly what the answer is. So I put a little uncertainty in. And I can say, well, what, what does that do to the global average temperature or to, to the temperature distribution? So there's, oh, this didn't come out very well. That's the feedback. So we put in little delta functions or close to delta functions at each latitude of a uncertainty and a feedback. And they're all positive feedbacks. So every one of these simulations is going to be warmer than the ensemble mean simulation. And so here's an example of that. So the, the black line here, or the black red line, is the ensemble mean from the climate models. And that little red dash thing coming up is just a perturbation we're going to add on at that latitude band. And that's the only place we add it. So we just make it more positive there. So for the same amount of forcing, locally, I expect to warm more in that region in that particular model. But the atmosphere of circulation is going to move that heat away and distribute it in other places. So you can take that equation there, and you can uh, add a perturbation, uh, an uncertainty in the feedback, a delta lambda, and you can subtract out the ensemble average change and come up with an equation for the um, response of temperature, the perturbation temperature, that is the uncertainty in one model due to that perturbation um, at that latitude. 
And if, it, if life is uh, really good for you and you have constant diffusivity, which you don't, uh, and constant feedbacks, you just end up with a basically exponential decay around where you put in that uncertainty. So locally, I will warm, but the circulation will take this stuff and distribute it away. And this is extremely powerful. So let me show you what the answer looks like. That black line, this is the equator to pole, equator to, oh, sorry, pole to pole. South is poles on the left. Sorry, these didn't come out very well. North pole is on the right, equator's in the middle. The black line is the ensemble average change you get from using the ensemble average feedbacks from the climate models, from the CMIP-5 models. And each one of those other lines is, if I put a perturbation in, like so for example, here, let me just show this. Here's a perturbation that we put in at 20 degrees. Here's one we put in at the equator. Here's one we put in at 20 degrees north. Here's 30 degrees north. Here's 50 degrees north. So we put perturbations in. And each one of these lines is the solution for what the temperature is with a model that has a perturbation at that latitude. And you can see that all the lines, they're all above it, right? It's a positive feedback perturbation, so they all have to be warmer. But the distribution, the shape, is exactly the same as the ensemble mean shape. This, this is the, the equivalent of pattern scaling. It's just there because of diffusivity. The atmosphere is just distributing this heat by storms and moving it from the tropics to the poles. OK. Um, so these are really hard to read. So let me just show you this plot, and I'll just move on. So if you just subtract, if you just like normalize each one of these curves, you take out the ensemble mean uh, so that you adjust the uh, mean temperature, the global mean temperature. In these cases, they all have the same thing. They all kind of collapse onto the same curve. So it says no matter where my uncertainty is, if it's, if it's at 20 degrees south in one model, 20 degrees north in one model, and, and it's like a more positive in, in model A and less positive in model B, the result is going to give me the same shape in the end of the temperature uh, profile change. It's going to be polar amplified, right? And um, uh, right, it's, yeah, and that's all because of diffusion. It's because diffusion is roughly the same in every model, just circulation. Every model has one storm track in the mid-latitude that's moving heat and water vapor from the tropics to the poles. Okay. Anything else I want to say about that? So I'm going to, I'm going to skip the next one because it's going to be impossible to read. And this is true for any uncertainty between 50 degrees south and north. So this is really powerful. This is why pattern scaling works, because the atmosphere is basically diffusive. And you have this uh, need to move vapor from the tropics to the polar regions, which give you that polar amplification. And that's a, that's a two-dimensional moist static energy balance model. There's nothing fancy. Enough. There's no land in it. And it tells you ex exactly what the climate models are doing. OK. So the uncertainty in regional feedbacks give rise to uncertainty in global, the global average, uh, uh, the global temperature distribution. Implications, if you're interested in, say, temperature change in Oxford in the future, then you can't gain much by resolving, like take a regional model and, um, say, downscaling all the GCMs for, um, for Oxford. Because basically, the uncertainty in Oxford is determined by, by tropical clouds, not by the stuff going on around here. That's true of every place in space, pretty much, except for the sea ice edges, where sea ice actually plays a pretty big role. OK. Um, so whenever, whatever gives you large uncertainty in climate sensitivity will give you large distal uh, regional uncertainty. So the largest uncertainty is in tropical feedbacks, hence the largest uncertainty in distal regional locations is due to uncertainty in the tropics. OK. This doesn't work for precipitation. Not a surprise, because precipitation is controlled by circulation changes. So let me just show you how bad this is for, this is, um, again, this is not great color scheme, but um, anywhere it's blue, this is the ratio of the precipitation at the end of the century compared to the precipitation at, at the end of last century. And, the, and it's blue in the high latitudes. These are regions where it's going to be wetter in terms of more rainfall at the end of the century. Uh, and then the regions where it's wet, which you can barely see, or sorry, drier, which is it's hard to see, but there are these subtropical regions here, uh, Sahel, for example, the regions where it will be drier in the future compared to this today. And if you do this same thing and you look at the standard deviation of the differences across the models, you find out the numbers are about the same. Models differ by about 20 to 30 percent in terms of what they say about uh, uh, precipitation. Uh, that's the leading pattern of differences across the models. It's pretty messy. It's tropics-centric. Uh, um, but it only explains 17% of the variance. So there's not one pattern that says, OK, climate sensitivity is, con 
is, is controlling the amount of precipitation here or there. Every model does it differently. So that's one problem. Um, it's not explained by simple diffusion, and it's not related to climate sensitivity. So that's the raw uncertainty we looked at before, the standard deviation of this precipitation ratio. And that's what you see after you remove the common pattern of differences, and the answer is you've made no improvement whatsoever. So precipitation is one of these things that if there's going to be improvement in, it's going to be, I don't know what it's going to take. It's not going to be good, though. Um, I mean, it's a hard problem. And, and if you did have to downscale, then there's an issue of do I trust a regional model or just do I empirically downscale? It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a tricky trade-off. OK, so, so where are we at? We're at that most of the uncertainty in the climate system is due to tropical clouds. Most of the uncertainty at your place in space is due to tropical clouds, wherever you live. Uh, and the physics of this is, is pretty simple, just diffusion. OK, now, this actually makes life easier. If you're actually interested in what's the impact of sort of temperature changes in the future, uh, you don't have to downscale, or you don't even have to look at all the different climate models. You just have to look at two. Right? You just have to look at a model with high sensitivity and a model with low sensitivity, and that should bracket pretty much the whole uncertainty in, in space. Now, let me show you an example. That works pretty well. Okay? And this is, example is in heat. And there's a lot of ways you can measure heat stress. Um, NOAA measures it by some combination of uh, temperature and relative humidity. If it means anything to you, uh, in, it, it works out to be wet bulb temperature for NOAA, but there's... Uh, other indices called humid, hum, humid X, and uh, there's various things. They all tell you roughly the same thing. Uh, the, in the NOAA language, basically, when you exceed a wet bulb temperature of 27 degrees, you're in this danger zone where you have heat cramps and heat exhaustions are likely. Heat stroke is probable um, with continued activity. And uh, the list of symptoms are really horrendous. Anyone actually experienced this? I've experienced this. It's not fun. Um, you get uh, fatigue, nausea, headache, excessive thirst, muscle, mu muscle aches, confusion, weaknesses, slowed heartbeat, dizziness, fainting, and it's pretty hard to work under these conditions. <clears throat> okay, now, and then you can go to extreme danger where heat stroke is imminent. Um, this is, uh, you take all the symptoms that I just read and you add to that um, vertigo, shortness of breath, vomiting, and blood in the urine, delirium, loss of consciousness. I mean, I, I don't know anyone who's experienced this. Uh, convulsions, uh, it's bad. Okay, so let's look at the last 35 years from ERA and say under these two definitions of danger and extreme danger, how often we see these conditions. So this is actually taking the, the ERA data, the last 35 years of uh, six hourly data and um, saying how often do we exceed the danger category today? And uh, God, this is a, didn't come out very well. But there's, you can see some reds. These are days per year. So on average, there's places like Oman and Bangladesh we, where like three weeks per year you exceed the danger zone, where you, you, we, where you have to be really careful about being outside and being active in any way. Um, can everyone see that all right? And there's a few other places, like there's Yucatan here where we're green, so like a couple of days per year. There's, uh, there's Eastern China where you're up to maybe two to five days per year. And then you could say, well, how often do you extreme extreme danger? And there's actually, there's uh, only two points on this plot. One here in uh, whatever this place is, Yucatan? No, what's, what's this little thing that sticks out of Central America? You know what I mean? I've never been there, so I don't know. But yeah, and then there's one place here that I guess this would be like near Oman where basically one day in the last 35 years hit the extreme danger category, where you basically, if you're out, you're, de you're dead. <clears throat> OK, so that's today. And then what I did is I said, OK, let's look at the end of the century using the business as usual mission style, ensemble mean. So we're just averaging all the climate models. We're getting a new annual cycle in temperature. We're assuming the same weather. So we're just adding that change in the annual cycle temperature to the same weather from that we've experienced in the last 35 years, which is probably a pretty conservative estimate um, of, of how often you extreme, uh, exceed the extreme danger. Because there's reasonable evidence that suggests as you warm up 
the vari variance uh, of temperature should increase, which means you're going to exceed extremes, the warm extremes, more often than not. OK. So same weather, plus this change in the annual cycle of temperature. And just going to look at, again, how often you exceed these things. And now, um, remember, this is the same picture I showed you before. So the global average temperature change is 3.7 degrees, but you have an annual cycle associated with that. And this is what you get with end of the century. And the numbers here have changed. The, the scale goes up to 320 days per year. So basically, it's all a year. So if you look at the Amazon, it's all a year when you're in the danger zone. If you look in the southeast U, uh, US here, you're in yellow and like orange. So you may be like a month, a little bit more than a month a year that you basically have to be really careful about being outside. Uh, Northern Australia. You're looking at almost, uh, there's a, a, the coastal rim here is about a half a year. You know, you have to be careful. Uh, India, obviously, you're looking at uh, one or two months per year. It's time is one or two months per year. Um, and then how often you extreme the extreme danger, where basically heat kills you very quickly. It's uh, maybe a week per year in the southeast US. Uh, a few, maybe a month per year in the Amazon, maybe a month per year in northern India. It's not good, OK? Now, um, now I'm going to take this pattern of change and just add to it the, that, that, that common pattern of difference and just multiply it by the most extreme climate sensitivity. So I'm just saying, let's just assume this, this pattern exists. I have the ensemble mean. I just add that change to it, and I just do that calculation again. Yeah. OK, good with that one? OK, so that's what you get here. And you can see the numbers go up pretty significantly. If you're in the southeast US, you're now into orange. So you're looking at maybe three months per year, basically all summer. You have to be really careful uh, about the amount of time you spend outdoors. Uh, there's a lot of Sahel, basically, here. And in, in, uh, where, where you're up over six months per year, there's, there's uh, Southeast Asia. India, where you're like uh, five months per year, where you're exceeding the danger category. And then uh, eastern China here, where you're, I guess you're in the yellow, so maybe six weeks per year. And the extreme danger here, there's, now it's getting pretty significant, where you're maybe three weeks per year in the southeast US, you cannot go outside for more than an hour, basically. And you don't want to be active. So these are pretty extreme conditions. Now, to illustrate what, how, this, how this is useful, this pattern is useful, what I did is I went through every single climate model, and I did this calculation. How many days per year you exceed this danger zone? And I said, for any one place this place, let's pick Oxford. Well, you never exceed it in Oxford, right? I mean, you're on an island, for God's sakes. OK, um, uh, but let's, OK, let's pick uh, some place where no one want to live, like Atlanta, maybe, like, OK, like down here. <laughs> OK, so you pick that place, and you say, like, OK, uh, I take my ensemble mean, I've added just like the, an extreme climate sensitivity, and I've got a number that's uh, whatever it is. It, it looks like it's maybe orange, maybe 107 days a year. So three and a half months per year, you can't be, you have to be really careful about being outside. Then what I did is I went to every single climate model, forget about these pattern things, I just said, here's the climate change this model predicted at the end of the year. I'm going to do this calculation and figure out how many days per year exceeds it. And I'm going to take the model with the most at that point in space and compare it to that number. So in other words, if I just take this shortcut, use one, one pattern, downscale one model, if you want to do it this way, look, do the heat application, how far off am I if I, instead of using all 18 models and, and probing the models and say just you know, like, what's, what's the worst case scenario? And that's this. This is the additional days you get if you actually probe every climate model and say, is there ever a climate model that gives me more than the ones on the right-hand side, that one estimate on the right-hand side? And the, the thing to point out here is the scales change. So basically, in the southeast US, yeah, you get an extra month, OK? OK, so there was a climate model that gave you an extra, yeah? So I'm just wondering, just looking at these, mm -hmm. um, so I'm just looking at a lot of like desert areas. So yeah. Uh, Western United States, Western China. Yep. Sahara. Yep. Is, is this because it's not as much human? Exactly. Dry. They're dry. They're really dry. So it's very hot, but it's extremely dry. Good point. Yeah. So like Western US, uh, a lot of Central Asia is, is white in those things. That's because they're really dry areas. So the heat stress is not as great, even though temperature is higher. Yeah. Yep. OK. Good one. OK. 
But basically, you know, what, what more do you get? Like if you're in Europe, you can see maybe there's like a light green there, which means the, it's a, an additional week. You know, there's, there's some model in, that, in that, that collection of 18 models that gave you one more week of extreme danger compared to, um, to let's see, God, I can't, yeah, I can look at, I'll look at this. Um, yeah, so Sahel Africa, for example, orange, uh, 150 days. Uh, and on the right-hand side, I add maybe another 40 days. The point here is that, okay, yeah, it's worse, but I mean, it's already, when you're talking about three months of kind of uninhabitable, what's another month, right? Like, it's a, it's a, you, you've got a vision here, which is, you know, using all 18 climb months doesn't give you much more information. Okay, and then here, the extreme maximum temperature that kills people, I don't know if you can see it, but there's basically, you know, there's less than five extra days. So there might be one model you can find that gives you like five more days of extreme deaths, that's five days on top of a month, right? The bad number is it's a month. Okay, now, uh, since the 1.5 degree report just came out, let me show you the answer for a world that's 1.8 degrees warmer. And that's here, right? So I think the, the and maybe this was in the report, but I haven't read the report yet, sorry, Miles. Okay, I read, uh, I read some of it, but I haven't read the whole thing. <clears throat> okay. But basically, you know, here's the difference between 8.5 high climate sensitivity. So this is pretty extreme. And here's a 1.8 degrees under. This is the RCP 4.5 scenario. And you still end up with a lot of yellow here, which is on the order of uh, six weeks per year of danger, right? So uh, 1.8 degree warmer world is still a real problem when it comes to heat stress for people. Okay. All right, so the summary here, there's a common pattern in the uncertainty in temperature change due to anthropogenic forcing, more warming over land than over ocean, global in extent, polar amplified, and that pattern is really basic physics. It's strongly correlated to climate sensitivity, which means, which means it's related to tropical clouds. Uh, let's see, let me go over here for change. It indicates that 60% of the global regional differences, right, uh, it, it, our, our uncertainty is due to one generic uncertainty due to tropical clouds and tropical feedbacks. <clears throat> uh, let's see, because the high atmosphere is really highly diffusive. After accounting for this common pattern of uncertainty, the regional uh, scale uncertainties is greatly reduced. Local processes account for less than, oh, I forgot to say in an absolute sense, the uncertainty in your place in space is less than a degree at the end of the century. Less than a degree compared to the ensemble mean of, of typically five or six degrees over land, right? 12 degrees over the pole. Uh, the implications are that in most cases, numerical downscaling of CMIT-5 models can't reduce regional uncertainty and, and mostly, most likely is make it worse. I have a couple of slides that just have this list of problems that come with regional downscaling, but I don't think there's a point here. Uh, in the rare instance the numerical downscaling is required, an efficient approach is to just the bounding regional study is just to use the, that common pattern and just to scale up the ensemble mean change with that pattern. And so I guess going back to that first statement, it's like, why would you care about the global mean? Well, it turns out that all of the uncertainty in your place in space is related to that global mean answer because of, because of the, the atmospheric dynamics. All right, and I think I'm gonna stop there. Thank you, David, for a great talk and for motivating us all to think about tropical clouds. Tropical yeah, clouds, yeah. So David is happy to take questions, but if I can just ask that you do wait for a microphone because this is being um, filmed, so just to make sure that, it's cap that the audio is captured. Thanks. Rich, if I understand right, uh, you do pattern scaling based on one target time, but a lot of, uh, say, Kyle Armour's work uh, indicates that as the ocean comes into equilibrium, the patterns corresponding to a given warming actually change. And I wonder to what extent you've explored right. what, what happens if you go, you know, say 500 years out and so forth, or, 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 or in terms of the, just the change in the yeah. pattern scaling. Um, I don't know if you remember, but there's a scatter plot of transient and equilibrium climate sensitivity, and the closer you get to equilibrium, the better this works. And that's simply because the, uh, the I mean, the uncertainty on short time scales is the uncertainty in ocean heat uptake, or the uncertainty in where sea ice is gonna go. But if sea ice is gonna, completely go, then there's no uncertainty anymore. And, and basically, one, the ocean uptake, heat uptake, which is different in every model, actually just come to adjustment, it doesn't matter anymore. So at equilibrium, 
you get your the pattern works best, right? And and it, it doesn't work great in the, the in the transient sense. You know, correlation was only point point six two, so that's that's uh, an issue. Where, but but I'd say that so so places where you still I'll have to explain. Um, North Atlantic, where the changes are small, any place where you have sea ice that's retreating is very different in each model. That doesn't come back too much to haunt the tropics, though, or, or the rest of the pole, simply because the, if you think about it, the, the, those two uncertainties are really high latitudes, and all the diffusion is kind of more equatorward to this. So in fact, you, can, you have to really get big uncertainties there before you can bleed that, un that temperature uncertainty back into the tropics. We try this a little bit, it's really difficult. I mean, you get huge uncertainty in polar temperatures, but it doesn't, doesn't communicate to the rest of the world. Thanks, David. Um, I guess proponents of downscaling, if they were or are in the room, might suggest that one of the main reasons you want to do it is actually for the hydrology. Because if right. you downscale, you know better the topography and you know better where the rain falls. And therefore, you know better which catchment's got the water in, which soil is moist. Um, mm -hmm. So I, part of this, kind of a two-part question. First is, would you disagree that it's useful to do downscaling for that? For question? hydrology. And, and the second bit is, is there any likelihood that there's actually a possible feedback? If you get the hydrological balance better at small scale, will that feed back into the large scale climate and the temperature that you've mostly been focusing on? Um, uh, okay, which of the two questions first? Um, yes, it, it, if you really want hydrology, you have to downscale because it's about precipitation and none of this pattern scaling works. Now the issue, of course, is that um, ra rainfall is done pretty poorly in, in climate models. Um, it, any place where you have really stable um, uh, uh, precipitation, mid latitudes, high latitudes, then regional downscaling to get sharper gradients, say due to mountains like that, is a, a sensible thing to do. And the question would be, do you want to do it with numerical modeling or empirical modeling? My choice would always be empirical, just because regional models um, can give you big uncertainties. In fact, I, uh, I could show you a slide, but um, um, the regional models for Europe, for example, they, they've been running them for a long time, and. Um, and, and actually the uncertainty, if you drive them with the modern day boundary conditions, so we actually know, you know what's coming in, there's no problem with the GCM getting the storm track in the wrong place. These are driving it with the ERA reanalysis and you say, how well do the models reproduce the seasonal average precipitation? Well, the answer is plus or minus 40%, right? That's actually worse than a GCM, much worse than a GCM. So, so you, I'd say like, yeah, if you wanna do better for changes in precipitation in places where Precipitation is stratiform precipitation. It's not dependent on your parameterization of convection. Um, empirically downscale if you can, if you got the data. And if you don't have the data, uh, pick on something else. I'd, that would be my response. Now, is there, is there a feedback? Um, there probably is, but it's probably not fundamental. I mean, I think it's probably a, a second order process. That would be my guess. Yeah. But the, if you look at it, I mean, there's these bake offs of regional models and how well they produce the modern climate. And they're generally, the uncertainties, the, because of the, uh, of, well, these are not built for climate purposes, right? And if you look at the uncertainties in precipitation, like I said, it's plus or minus 40% in the, uh, not even in the, that's the ensemble mean, that's the climatology. And then the interannual variability in these models is horrendous. Temperature uncertainties are the same order as the GCM. So I, 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 don't, I don't think in general, unless you happen to be in a place like Norway maybe, or, and I wouldn't even do that. Because um, every model puts a storm track in a slightly different place, right? And they change it in a different way. So, I mean, I know people want to know regional precipitation changes, but I just don't think it's something we should be promising to deliver. Can you move on? Question for Miles. Hello. Uh, hi, David. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. This is fascinating stuff. I, I'm trying to reconcile it in my head. Is, is Thomas Hornigold here? Because actually it's on behalf of... Yeah, he was probably one of the people who failed to bribe the doorman. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, of which I believe there are quite a few. Is Thomas? Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you, oh, yeah, there you are. Would you want to ask the question or shall I? I mean, if you, <laughs> can, can, um, so, so Thomas has done a bunch of experiments. Uh, yeah, Thomas done stripy sunshades. Why doesn't, why doesn't this apply to stripy sunshades? Do you want to ask uh, the question? In, in what respect does it not apply to them? <laughs> wait, apply, wait, apply to what? Okay, um, so, so Thomas has imposed, if I get this right, Thomas, um, uh, uh, stripey geoengineering experiments where yes. he puts oh, a yeah. zonal sunshade across the planet and finds quite a lot of structure in the response. Okay, at least... Yes, yes, yeah. but over time, the temperature response that you get is presumably behaving in a similarly diffusive way, I imagine. Well, 
in the, the residual as well. Yeah, I mean... It's not just one pattern. Uh, yes, but it's over the course of the first decade. It starts to diffuse out a little bit over time. Okay, but I, you do, you do, you do okay I, I retract my question. I, I apologise. I, 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 it, it, it was going to be important, but apparently it isn't. Okay, but... Okay. But the, well, the, I, I'd say if, would this apply? Would this apply to a geoengineer, a, a regional geoengineering pattern? Um, it should. And I, actually, um, uh, Malta Stuker has done these um, prescribed CO2 bands, and it actually works pretty well in those things. On the, and of course, if you apply a, a, a CO2 warming to the polar regions for the reason we were just talking about a second ago, um, it's hard to get that warming out of there. So you really have to warm it up a lot to diffuse that to get to get energy diffusion back. But in other bands, like when, when Malta put in bands of CO2, basically it's distributed really nicely um, by distribution of moist static energy. If you wait long enough, you have to wait long enough, right? Do you have any idea how long you'd have to wait? Uh, 100 years. 100 years, OK. Maybe less, but depends. Do you have a slab model or you have a GCM? So if you, in a GCM, if you applied this in a, I mean, there's a whole, if you applied it right in a place where the, there's a very, very deep ocean mixed layer, right, you're gonna have to wait for a long time for this thing to happen. But once it warms up enough, it'll diffuse just like this, right? So I think that might be the difference. If you apply a strip at 50 degrees north, right, you have a mixed layer that's 4,000 meters deep in the North Atlantic, it's gonna take a long time to get up to an equilibrium. And once, but, it, but as it's coming up, basically that heat's gonna be diffused away. On the, um, my, my question's about the, the human health effect. Have you looked at, in addition to the absolute stress levels that you showed us, the extra stress that people suffer in different areas? The point being that people who live in, on the equator are already used to living at high yeah. temperatures and great and high levels of humidity. And the absolute stress that you show might not be much of an increment over where they are at the moment. Right. The extreme danger one is a physiological thing. So even if you live in the tropic, you're dead. Okay, but the danger one is, is not. I mean, that's a little bit like where you live. So a lot of, as you probably know more about this than I do, but a lot locally what's considered hot is varies from place to place, right? And depending on how much you've adjusted to it, how much society has adjusted to it. So this is just a ball. I think the purpose here wasn't to say that's the answer for heat stress in the future, you know, under an RCP 8.5 system, but, but is there, uh, can you can you take shortcuts rather than saying I need to downscale all my climate models? Can I just downscale one that has high sensitivity and that's going to give me like an upper bound, and one with a low sensitivity will give me a lower bound? And I think the answer is yeah, you can get away with that. But what you what you call critical at each place, there's lots of ways you can do this, and we're starting to look at this. We're actually working on uh, how heat fest, uh, stress affects agricultural workers in the U.S. Um, mostly migrant workers. You can imagine how popular we are in the U.S., but, um, <laughs> but that's what we're working on. And it's, it's a tough problem, but that's, um, yeah. There's a question from Tim over here. Um, hi, David. Um, hey, you, you sort of compared the temperature and precipitation effects by saying that the, the, the precip was very circulation bound, whereas temperature is not. I mean, that's only true to some extent. And uh, for example, here in the UK, heat waves are clearly linked to circulation, anti-cyclonic mm -hmm. circulation patterns. And so any attempt to estimate, you know, whether the number of, of, uh, of dangerous or, or, or death, death, deathly heat waves has got to take into account the propensity for changes in circulation. For sure. And this is mm -hmm. something which CMIT models do not do a good job at. So I guess my question is, you have assumed implicitly that uncertainty is actually represented well by the uh, CMIP models, uh, but I would suggest um, that they're at the regional level that, that yeah. could be called into question. Uh, okay, so what, because I know there's a problem with that in the models, but what we did for the future one is we assumed the same weather as today, you know, and that's, that's an assumption, but... Um, but again, but, that, that assumes, you know, that anticyclones occur with the same frequency, but that's a crucial question if you yep, want to answer the heat. That's point. an open question, yeah. And, and uh, let's see, there's something else I can say one of those. Hold on, hold on. Uh, oh, yeah, the other thing we did is we're just counting days. Like, we're not defining heat waves as four days in a row. So that's another issue that it makes this complicated. Um, uh, but yes, the, the frequency of rocking, how that's going to change the future, those are all really cool science problems. Um, uh, uh, and, and you can add that on top of this. It doesn't change any of the implications for this, but because but, you'd want a different weather. You'd want a, 
it, and it might be interesting to see um, what's the range of uncertainty in blocking in climate models. And that might be different than the range of uncertainty in climate sensitivity. It certainly will be, just like, the, like in precipitation. Now, I should say that we didn't try too hard to do pattern scaling with precipitation. There certainly should be ways, like there's some common things, like you know, the rich get richer, poor get poor kind of arguments people made. And, and, and every climate model, but every climate model puts precipitation in a different place in the tropics. So just kind of sweeping this all under the rug is a little bit unfair because every model, for example, might do the same thing as increasing precipitation in ITCZ, but the ITCZ might be in a different place starting in each model, which case it, it showed that there's more uncertainty than there really is. But we didn't try to do that, but there's ways you could maybe eke out more information from from the models in terms of scaling for precipitation. I've not tried it, it's hard. Yeah. Just take one more question. <clears throat> this is a question from a layman. Um, do your conclusions reinforce the idea that it's less important whether you have relative success in some regions versus in other regions of reducing CO2 emissions and the overall success around the world, or was that already assumed before the, your, your conclusions? Okay, wait, uh, say that again, say that again. Wait, and how do you well, you, find kept, you kept coming back to the point that it's the global mean change that's, in, that's the relevant thing. Some countries might be more successful, or some regions, in reducing CO2 emissions over uh, years yeah. than others. But does that not really matter? Because at the end of the day, it's overall what the reduction It's the total is. accumulation at the end of the day. The atmosphere is really good at distributing this stuff, mixing was it that up. Was that known before? The, just, oh, yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Way, yeah, before I was born, even. Right? Yeah. That's even before me. <laughs> Yeah, no, the atmosphere doesn't, inc I mean, that's what makes this a hard problem, right? The atmosphere just accumulates CO2 and distributes it. So the difference in concentration in CO2 around the planet, it, you know, varies by like a percent, you know, and so it doesn't matter who puts it in where, it all accumulates. And, and it comes out thousands of years later, if we, if we can wait that long. <laughs> all right, well, I think in view of the time, before I thank David again. There's one more, one more, no. Oh, yeah, that's a oh. time. I don't know. Can we do it over? Let's do it. I suggest we do it over drinks. Before I thank David again for a, for a talk that um, has generated lots of discussion, which will no doubt spill over into, into the drinks, I'd like to thank the Oxford Martin School again for hosting us um, and remind everybody, and thank you all for coming, and remind everyone that there is a drinks reception now just next door. So please don't dash off. Please come and continue the conversations. Catch David if you haven't had a chance to ask your question. Uh, but now, if you can just join me again in thanking David for a great talk. <laughs>